So our next talk is on pushing security from the outside by Chris DeWeese. Please give Chris a round of applause. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, just so I can get a feel of everybody, from everybody who's uh, here, uh, how many people here actually work in the security field? Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> how many people don't work in the security field? Okay, great. So I, I have something for both sides, uh, and I, I think you'll be able to take this one over the next 20 minutes. Hope you'll be able to take something away from this. But like uh, like I said, I'm here to push security from the outside. So what's the outside? I guess that's the first question. So I don't work in security. Actually, I don't even work in the IT department at our company. But I'm out there pushing security. I do lead a team of software developers, and we're generating software used within our business. But like unlike most teams in our company, security is not an afterthought. It's, it's an important thing that we talk about every day in my group. Today I want to talk about my experiences during my career related to security and how I've tried to push security from non-traditional roles, basically outside of IT. Some of the things I'm going to cover with you is how pushing security can be both fun and rewarding, how we all need to try to train, how we all need to try to train people to think like hackers, and what is responsible disclosure. And if you're in the information security team, how can you create an environment to allow everyone to push security, whether it's from the inside or the outside? So as I was working, for this talk, working on this talk, a question and idea that came up again and again is security is everyone's responsibility. I think everybody here would probably agree that's the truth. But at your company, is that really true? So at my company, safety is the number one priority. But how do we get to the point where both safety and security are everybody's responsibility? It's going to take some work, and it's going to take some work for most sides. And if you don't do it, you're going to end up with something like this. So I picked my first lock today, thanks to my mentor. But I'm pretty sure even though I don't know how to pick locks very well. I can bypass the security. And if we don't have everybody pushing security from the outside, this is what we're going to end up with. So I talked about how pushing security can be rewarded. And the way I've chosen to do that is mentorship. There is a developer in my company who I often talk about security related ideas and, and practices. This guy's passionate about security. He also knew how to develop secure code. So as we talked, I knew this guy needed to get out from doing software in, into our InfoSec team. So when a position came up, I encouraged him to, to apply. And then once I got him to apply, I mentored him on, on the process and made sure that he, he was successful, that he was successful with his interview. And he got that job. And now he's in information security. And even better, they assigned him to the responsibility of securing the code within our company. So that mentoring has, one, has been a way, one way for me to push and help, help secure help with security in my company. He still comes around and we still talk about things. And what we're still, I'm still getting my ideas on how we can put, he can push security within, within the company. But I talk about fun too, right? We want to have fun at work. So, what's the most basic problem we have in security? People don't lock their workstations. It's been, it's been a problem my whole entire career. Every company I've worked at, we've run into this problem. So what can we do about it? Well, I'm going to go from pushing hard to maybe not pushing so hard. So, probably the worst I've ever seen is an admin who doesn't want to lock his, lock his screen. And when asked about it, the response was, I was only away for a few minutes. What could someone do? So here's an idea to teach somebody what they can do. If you don't know, and this is a Windows example, but you, in, in the registry, you can replace any program with a pro, debug program. So why not take the accessibility tools and replace it with a command prompt? 
Then you're going to get something like this. You're going to get a Windows logon screen with a command prompt with admin rights, access to the uh, start menu, and an homage to B sides calc.exe. This is a very simple thing to do. And it really it will really drive the message home. Now you gotta be careful, you don't want to just do this and leave it. Because <laughs> you just put a security hole in something. But it's something you can demonstrate. You can take a, a, a laptop that's not on the that's not on the domain and, and show them how to do it. What's that? Yeah, this is a live screen. It's, it's basically uh, you can go into the registry and replace using the debug two functionality to replace it with a command prompt. So I've got this KP on the next Yeah. Just Google it. It's there. <laughs> using debug to replace the registry. Okay, so that's pretty aggressive. Let's do something a little more a little less aggressive. Uh, one of the favorites of mine, and this one works really well, is to go into their monitor and invert the screen. <laughs> unlike unlike Tom Cruise and Top Gun, most people can't work a mouse when it's inverted. And when they do get it undone, they'll probably lock their screen because they don't want to do to, to that happen again. Now we got one person who I've done it to so many times, he actually is very good at using the screen as inverted. But you can only try. Probably the easiest thing you to do, uh, I was at a company that, that made these up. This is just sticky pads. If you're in a Windows shop, everybody should know Windows L is the quick, easiest way to lock your computer when you step away. Super simple and super effective. You find an unlocked computer, you put the sticky there, and you lock it. Hopefully, they get the message. Okay, but earlier I said you need to think like a hacker. So let's talk about that. So I work with software developers, and this is the talk we have over and over and over again. Is it a feature or is it a bug? And th those are great conversations, but sometimes we need to escalate that conversation. Is it a feature, bug, or security risk? So one day I was in a meeting, and we had to look something up. And that required us to log on to a website on our, on our internet. So we log on to get the information, and the guy running the meeting is greeted with a password reset form. His password had expired. Well, he didn't want to reset his password during the middle of the meeting, so he had to cancel button. Next thing we know, we're looking at the information that we're supposed to be looking at. Yeah, oh, that was the same thing I did. And, and in fact, the meeting just went on. Everybody else just kind of said, you know, oh, we got the information, let's we'll talk about it. And I actually stopped the meeting and said, hey, what just happened? And I went to the meeting leader, he said, oh, I just hit cancel for some reason. My uh, password expired, I didn't want to reset it, but it still let me get to where I need to go. So the meeting finished, and then I'm kind of sitting here thinking, what just happened? Obviously, in my mind, we just found a pretty big security hole on this website. And the next thing, being a guy leading the software development team, is why didn't this have developed in testing? Surely the tester did some testing on this password reset. Well, it turns out they just test, test the case that they knew of. A good user is going to, if they're told to reset their password, is going to reset their password. They're not going to worry about that pesky cancel button. But if you have people think like hackers, the first thing they're probably going to do is press that cancel button to see what happens. Turns out, what does happen when you hit that cancel button is you get a, a, a cookie anyways. It doesn't matter if you, you have an expired password or not. So what do I do? Well, if I'm not pushing security, I think, great, hey, this is a feature. I just found out I got a non-expiring password on this website. I just put in my old password, hit the cancel button, and I'm in. But I'm not doing that. So what do I need to do? I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone around here about responsible disclosure. But think about it. At your company, what's the responsible disclosure policy? Do you even have one? You might have one for external users, but what about internal users? What are they supposed to do? So I start asking around, what am I to do? I think I just found a security hole. I got some suggestions, including ignore it. You found a good feature, which I, obviously I did not go with. 
Uh, one was open a ticket, because we all know tickets get taken care of. I mean, I've had tickets lost, misrouted. We get tickets all the time and they're for the wrong thing. So I wasn't going to do that. So I talked to some friends. I contacted I, I, who were able to help me who, to find out who was responsible for this website. We worked together. I got in contact with them. We set up in their test environment. We verified that this truly was happening and a, and a security hole, and we got it fixed. But we've got to remember, this would have never happened if someone wasn't thinking like a hacker, or if people were thinking like a hacker, and they knew about responsible disclosure. So one of the things I always try to do is never pass up an opportunity to talk about security. Passwords is a great thing to talk about. When I'm in meetings, when I, when I, oftentimes when I go into meetings, I log in with my 20 plus character password, and the first question I get is, why do you have such a long password? The password policy doesn't require that much. And I, that gives me an opportunity to talk to them about, we shouldn't be using passwords, we need to use passphrases. People are surprised here in Windows that you can actually put spaces as part of your password. I also tell them, you know, if you can, at least do 14 characters, because greater than 14 characters on Windows avoids the landman hash problem. They might not need to know about the landman hash problem, but if you tell them 14 or more, maybe they'll do that. And if they keep asking questions, I'll talk to them about password managers. Obviously, that has to go with personal preference and policy with your company, but things, things that you can do. So the other thing about passwords, that I did recently, is I was sent to a public speaking class. Hopefully at this point you're not thinking, whoa, what a waste of money. <laughs> I was, our, our class assignment was basically learn about how to be a public, better public speaker, and we, we did it by doing a five to seven talk, five to seven minute talk. So I thought, why not talk about passwords? We have a whole convention on passwords. Surely I could get five to five to seven minutes of material for that for that comp, for my talk. So I gave the talk three times. Each time I had a little bit more to make it really interesting for the team and to try to get them both thinking like hackers and looking for problems. The last time I went and I created an email account. I added second factor authentication, and then I gave them the password. I said, prove to me you got into that email account, and I'll buy you lunch. Now, luckily, it wasn't this group that I was trying with, and I didn't have anyone successful. But I had a lot of people who tried. And I felt that it was a big success because I got them thinking like a hacker, and some of them even tried to social engineer me. They were all trying things that they didn't even know they were trying. So you might be thinking now, I can't do all these things, but surely you can do something. How about just fixing the problems you can influence? Okay, this isn't a file I was given, but at one, in one, at one point in my career, I was given a file much like this, a passwords.xls file. No problem with that, right? It was even better, because when I asked what, what, what we were to do about this, they said, don't worry, it's password protected. I didn't have time to teach them about how easy I would be to bypass, but I did take the, this opportunity to fix this problem. So I took this, this, this information, I got it off our, sh our shared drive, where that's where it was located. I set up a, a key pass instance with my team, and then we added second factor authentication. Now I know what you're saying, that's probably not the best solution, but it's way better than this solution. Matter of fact, I found, I've never found a password.xls file other than one I've been given, but I found a lot of other information on shared drives. I found financial information, performance plans, staffing plans, and what do I do? Well, I take them for myself, right? No, I, don't, I do take them, but not for myself. I take them, I move them off a public chair to somewhere where they're safe, and I go ahead and notify the user, hey, you shouldn't have this information out there. Here's what you can do to secure it, and you need to be very careful. 
One of the most interesting, like, one of the most interesting things I've seen is data leakage on calendars. So I'm going to give you an example. Uh, this is my calendar. That's just a mock-up. But let's say here we have nine o'clock on Monday. The manager is meeting with the HR about employee plan or employee performance plan in the HR rep's office. Followed by an employee meeting with the HR rep in the HR rep's office. What's going on here? Someone's going on a performance plan. That's probably information that you don't want to write. It's real simple. You just need to be cognizant of the information you're putting on there. So here's uh, I have a secret meeting going on at the Neon Museum on Thursday. So, but I know no one else knows about it because I have it slot here. So whether it's Outlook or if you're lucky enough to use Lotus Notes, uh, no, this feature is always good. Still happy Lotus Notes user. <laughs> okay, so I talked uh, about, I, I told you I had a lead development team. Um, one of the things that I hear often is, or we, we talk about often, is secure code development. So what can we do about secure code development? Not this. This is often the response you get from developers when you talk about information security. Nope, not my problem. I don't want nothing to do with it. InfoSec is going to scan that thing, and once I pass the scan, we're going to production. Right? I'm sure you've all seen it. But is that really the way to be doing this? Some of the things that we talk about on our team is how we can secure our, our, both our code and our environment from the beginning. So you need to think about things like what's the type of information you're storing? How are you going to store that information? What's the security model that you're going to use? There's a bunch of good information out there on developing secure code. You can choose to follow it or do this. I would recommend following it. The other thing I've trained my team on is default passwords. Once again, back to passwords. So I think I've gotten to the point where they know this. I, I can be a master hacker in our company if they're going to do things like this. So, if they put a piece of equipment or a website up, whether it's in dev test or production, and they leave a default password, they know I'm going to reset it. And at this point, they don't do it anymore. But there were times when things got put out there, I reset it, and then they had to come to me and get the password. I don't know why they just didn't reset it again and just reset the password themselves, but we'll have to talk about that at another time. So I've talked a lot about pushing, but I also need to talk about pushing too hard. <laughs> One of the ideas of me giving this talk was to even push security within my company. I thought it was a great idea. If, you would be, if I was up here talking about the first, if version 1.0 of this talk, I'd probably leave this room and get a call from the CISO. Because I was pushing way too hard. And I, I took the help of my mentor and some friends to talk about the offset issues I had with my talk and just the things that I was revealing with this talk. So, thanks to, to Kat for that. But there's another good reason why we shouldn't push too hard. Who knows who Randall Schwartz is? Okay, if you don't know who Randall Schwartz is, you should. You could know about him because he was a Perl guy. He's one of the most, one of, he goes by Merlin. Maybe you know Merlin. He's one of the more notable Perl developers. Uh, but early in his career, and sorry, this isn't really meant to Rand, it's just kind of friends of Rand's side. Uh, he decided that he was going to push security within his, within his company. He was working as a sysadmin. He was unhappy with the security practices, so he was going to show them. He was going to push security. So what did he do? He did some un unauthorized pen testing. What happened? So this is back in 1995. He got he got big trouble. When I say big trouble, we're talking one three felony convictions, three felony convictions, and one misdemeanor. Think about that. So we don't want that to happen. I don't want that. I don't want you to go come to the stock and say Chris told me to push, so I'm going to push, and end up like this. 
So for Randall, this took 12 years and in excess of $200,000 to clear up. But he eventually got it cleared up. But if you're gonna remember it, if you're gonna remember anything about pushing too hard, remember the story of Randall. Okay, most of you guys are infosec. So I want to specifically talk about me. So I'm talking about, I'm talking about pushing, I'm giving people ideas how to push. You want everybody to be able to push. So let's take the example of these guys pushing this boat up to the beach. Looks like a fun thing to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah. So I'm sure that the, the guys out in front, if they were the only ones pushing, they'd have a tough time pushing this boat up the beach. But everyone together is liable to be success. So if you think back to that picture in the beginning, everybody around the lock helping push security, that's what we want to do. So what are some things you can do? First, just encourage people to talk about security. Every, some, someone doesn't beat you being the information security team to talk about security. You might want to make sure they're pushing the right things or saying the right things, so train them. But it's okay for them to talk about security. Give them the tools to talk about security. Spend some money, buy those Windows out ticket sticky notes. Recognize users who are, are, are being secure outside of information security. Formalize an advocate role if you can. I, I feel like I'm doing an unofficial advocate role, but there's no reason why you can't formalize it. And if your HR, if your HR group would allow it, give them some work to do. Everybody's short staffed these days. Maybe you can have a rotation program and have them come work in information security for a little bit. Or make them honorary Randall Blue Team members if you do that. I'm sure someone who's interested and had the opportunity would love to do that. I would if I could. So, talk about a bunch of different things. If you're not in information security, which is a small group of, of you, some I get help, but hopefully you can take some of these ideas and use it to push security within your company. And if you're in that information security company, Part of sector of your company, why don't you go ahead and try and create an environment that will allow people to push security? And if you didn't get that out of the talk, come find me. Because, like I said, you should never pass up an opportunity to talk about security. Thanks. Uh, yeah, when you talk about pushing security from the outside, um, it sounds like in, in a lot of corporations it's going to be uh, a culture change. What are some things that you found would, that were effective in getting that culture change, and what are some things you found that were not so effective at changing culture for security? I think the hardest thing is that, based on my experience, the information security team has, has basically walled themselves in, and they don't really allow outsiders. And I think it needs to start first within the information security culture to say, we're going to allow this guy in. So we're going to say, Chris, we're going to let you push. But if you're going to push, these are the things that you want you to push on, and we, these are the things that we don't want you to push on. And just give some training. I mean, everybody, I don't think anybody wants their company to end up like Sony, right? I hope not. Maybe there are some people who do, but, so, is that? Hey, Chris, uh, you mentioned that you have a, uh, there's a CISO in, in your, uh, CISO in your company? Yes. Um, I'm curious, where does, where, where does he fall? I mean, has he been supporting you in your efforts? I, I guess I'm at a loss here. Like, how, wh where is he in this picture? Like, has he been supporting anything? Has the supporting uh, uh, to, ta to tack onto your question about the culture change? I'm, I'm really curious. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we we we've talked about ideas, but uh, I think. So I, I, I work at a company that's a subsidiary of another company, and I think he's being he's being given guidance that causes problems for doing things like that. So he's he's doing the best. I think he's doing the best he can. Uh, 
He doesn't know about this, so. <laughs> so I think I, it's probably safe that I stop there. If you want to talk about it after, I think. I think we have time for one more question. Come on, one more good question. I, I have one. If, uh, yes, sir. So to follow up uh, with what Ming was saying, um, where does the permission come into play with the CISO and, and kind of how far you go? Yeah. Uh, so my advice would be to uh, probably check with the CSO before pushing. I didn't do that, and there's a reason I didn't do that, but uh, we'll see what happens. Well, it's, it's like I said, uh, version 1.0 of this talk probably would have got me a lot more hot water. So we'll see. Uh, I'll, put the, I'll put the information out on your list, and if, if uh, after this talk I'm looking for a job, you'll know where to find it. <laughs> I got that next week for all the good help you get. Great. Thanks, Chris.